Anyway, one of the biggest problems that people have with, with turning is sharpening. Turning with dull tools is not fun. And many, many people quit wood turning because they never learned to properly sharpen their tools. And it's a shame, but that's the number one reason that people quit wood turning, is they cannot develop a sharp tool. Part of the reason for that is, I think there's an awful lot of hype in all the catalogs, the magazines, all this stuff, and it, they kind of gloss over a lot of things. They don't show you all these little great little tools and gadgets and everything else, but they don't tell you how to use it. Many of them work, many of them don't, and I'm going to show you a couple that do and a couple that don't. But the main focus of this is to tell you why something works. If I can explain to you why it works, you'll understand how it works. And since many of you are woodworkers as well as wood turners, I think some of the analogies with, a, like for instance, a, a block plane, you know, something like that, you'll understand better than a lot of wood turners who never picked up any other tool other than a wood turning tool. So um, what I'd like to do is also explain to you about angles. You know, many people talk about angles, they talk about grinds, they talk about all kinds of things as if, as if they're interchangeable, and they're not. And I'll explain to you about a perfect angle. And I'll show you a perfect angle for a tool, but I'll also show you there's no such thing as a perfect grind. And I'll show you why, and you'll understand why. And I think if you can do that and kind of put it all together, I think you'll have a lot less trouble sharpening your tools. I like to start at the grinder. Uh, the grinder is really the focus of everything we do. People talk about, well, you can't use a high-speed grinder. Okay, that's a high-speed grinder. You know, they tell you a lot of things you can and can't do. You gotta use this, you gotta use that. Well, I guess I'm gonna just show you that what I do doesn't really matter. You know, it, it, high speed, slow speed. Um, has anybody ever sharpened a little quarter-inch spindle gouge? Yeah, that's right. Was it, was it this long when you were done? <laughs> I'll show you how to do it to where that's not gonna happen. And uh, I'll also show you that everybody has a slow-speed grinder. And it's kind of interesting, everybody does, whether you know it or not. So let's talk a little about that. One of the things that people like to do is they like to talk about the grinders and they, and they like to get them as cheaply as possible. And that's kind of interesting because a lot of people will, will buy a six inch grinder because they're 10 or $15 cheaper than an eight inch. And I think that's very foolish and I'll tell you why. All of the tools that we have are hollow ground. Does everybody understand what hollow ground means? Okay, and if you think about it, they have to be hollow ground. If you take a tool, for instance, and let's use a spindle roughing gouge as an example, and this cutting edge right here, I don't know if you can, okay, this cutting edge right here is hollow ground. If it wasn't, if it was perfectly flat, and I put it up against a piece of wood that's round, does anybody know what will happen? Lift the cutting edge right off. And what would happen is as I rock it on that non-hollow ground surface, I rock, it up to catch, uh, I rock it up to cut, it's probably going to catch because it would be an unsupported cut. And so everything we do is hollow ground. All of our tools are hollow ground because they're going to rub up against something that's round. We all understand that. Anybody not understand that? Good. Anybody want to explain it to me? No? Okay. So how does it become hollow ground? Okay. We put it against the grinding wheel and that's how we make it hollow ground. Now, when you buy these tools, everybody's familiar with Sorby and, and Hamlet and all these companies. They all seem like really huge companies. They're not. They're very, very small. I think Sorby has eight people that make tools. They're all made by hand. Okay? A man who actually shapes these cutting edges sits over a grinding wheel with his legs spread apart. That wheel is about this. It's probably about five feet in diameter. And he holds the tool against it and grinds it. And that's how he puts the actual grind. Now, these used to come, all these tools, used to come with a little card inside the package that said they're not ready for use. They have to be sharpened. They stopped doing that some years ago. I don't know why. But everybody assumes they're ready to go. They're not. Because that wheel is so big, and this hollow grind is not even close to being hollow ground because that wheel is so big. And there's no way that you're going to use that tool. Plus, it's only ground just to make it look nice. If they sent this tool to you with a perfectly flat edge with nothing ground on it, you'll say, hey, I want my money back. That's not what I wanted. I wanted the tool ready to use. So that's why it's ground that way. But understanding that hollow grind, the minimum radius that we can use is just under six inches. Everybody follow that? That's the minimum radius for that hollow grind that we can use. It's about a quarter of an inch less, like five and three quarters, somewhere around there. So if I bought a six inch grinder with six inch wheels and they wore down a quarter of an inch, what do I do? I throw them away. So I just took $80 worth of wheels that I used for maybe a year or two. Yes? Why do you say six inches is the minimum? Okay. Are you assuming you're doing 10, 12 inch bolts? No, I'm not assuming that at all. 
let's just look at that cutting edge, okay? And it's a hollow ground right here, okay? When I put up a piece of wood to that, it doesn't matter, the radius doesn't matter. What I want to do is I want to be able to rub the bevel, and I want that cutting edge to be exposed as I lift the handle. As this radius gets bigger, this angle becomes more acute than it starts to catch. Okay? So there is a minimum, and that minimum is not designed by me. That's the minimum that these tools are designed to operate under. And a lot of people never put that together. They never realize that, well, it's like five and three quarters. Anything more than that, and you, it's noticeable. Have you ever seen a tool sharpened on a six inch wheel that's really worn down? This looks like such a U. It is so apparent. I mean, you cannot miss it. So what happens is there's very little bevel surface, and all you have is the cutting edge extending out. And by doing that, as you go to lay the tool down to get the bevel rubbing and lifting the handle, it just catches. And people don't know why, because of the hollow run. So that's not something that I decided. That's just physics, the way it works. And there's nothing I can do to change that. Okay? So based on that, we want to buy eight inch wheels. It's probably the most common is eight inch wheels. Because you can wear these down to a little under six inches, and probably in your lifetime you'll never do that. These wheels here are very, very old. They're probably, I think that grinder is uh, maybe eight or nine years old, something like that, and the wheels have been on it ever since. And so, and I use this in my shop every single day. So to invest in an eight inch grinder with eight inch wheels, you know, it, it's not that expensive. As a matter of fact, but be careful how I say this, the Woodcraft grinder comes with the wheels and they're normal. They used to be ninety-four dollars. I think it's one hundred and fourteen now. I don't think you can even get them. I think they quit. Uh, well, it's temporary, but they're not in there on their website. Really? I just got the new catalog. It's in there. So maybe they're back. Maybe they're back, or maybe they just left them in the catalog. I don't know. But my example is, and uh, who's it? Um, Clingspore has a similar one. I think it's five dollars more. That comes with the wheels. So if you look at it that way, I've I bought those as cheap as sixty-five dollars. Get $80 worth of wheels for $65 with a grinder. And it's a slow speed grinder and they work, okay? So there's always, uh, so now that we know the size that we need, the speed is always a problem. Some people say that um, you have to have uh, 1725, it has to be. And my answer to that is why? You know, it really doesn't matter. This is a high speed grinder. Why? Because I didn't know if you'd have a grinder here, and so I brought one, and this is the only portable one I have. I've got a couple of those deltas that weigh 200 pounds a piece. I wasn't bringing those. So, but this is used in my shop every day, and it's not a problem. Basically, the problem that most people have using a grinder is their pressure. They put far too much pressure on it, creating heat. And I'll get into that when we talk about the wheels. So basically, it's your choice what speed you want to run. Now, don't forget, when you're running 1725, 1725 RPM on a six inch grinder, look at the surface area that's going across your tool, okay? I think it's about 18 inches per revolution going across. Now let's change that to an eight inch wheel. That's 24 inches every revolution. Let's go to a, a 10 inch grinder. That's over 30 inches going past your tool every revolution. So the people who complain the most about speed never think what size is that wheel and how much surface area is going past the tool. People don't think of that. And if you don't think of that, then really what difference does the speed make? A six inch grinder at, um, at one revolution is about 18 inches, but at 10 inches over 30. So that's twice the speed already. So which one do we start at? Can we do a six inch at 3600 and a 10 inch at, eight, at 1725? No one ever puts that together. So the reality of it is learn to use it because regardless of what you have, it'll work and it'll work fine. So it's not so much the grinder in the speed that's important, it's to make sure that the grinder itself runs true. And I have not found one yet that runs perfectly true. Has anybody here found one that works perfect? I don't think you will. Don't ask me why, but um, I'm a dealer for jet and I get a lot of the scratch and dent jet pieces. They will not sell their grinders as scratch and dent because they are so bad you can't fix them. I mean, out of the box they wobble. It's just, I think it's part of the problem. Okay, so we've got the grinder, and we've decided that speed is not that important, but our preference is. So you decide you want a slow speed or a high speed, okay, fine. Let's talk about the wheels. The wheels are what are called friable wheels. They're aluminum oxide, and they're called friable. What that means is, as I'm grinding something, 
the surface is constantly coming off, exposing fresh aggregate for me to grind my tool against, allegedly. It doesn't do it completely, but it does a good job. Most grinders that are not intended for wood turning come with the gray wheels. Everybody has seen the gray wheels. They're great for sharpening, like lawnmower blades and things like that. They're not good for high-speed steel. High-speed steel is what most of our tools are made from. Um, because what they do is they clog and they create tremendous amounts of heat. The heat transfer from clogged uh, wheels is tremendous. Which brings up another point. Um, Everybody know about carbon steel? That's what most tools used to be made of. Carving tools are all carbon steel. A surgeon's scalpel is carbon steel. Carbon steel can get much, much sharper than high-speed steel, but it doesn't last very long. The edge won't last long. Um, carbon steel blues at about 750 degrees. But carbon steel tempers between 700 and 750 degrees. So the first time you've turned that tool blue, you throw it away because the temper is gone. High speed steel blues at about 750 degrees, but it tempers at about 1100. You can turn it blue all day long. It's not gonna matter, as long as you don't turn it white. If you turn it blue, it's only on the surface, and I may show you how, how you can just take that right off. It's not into the metal at all, it's just on the surface. Um, and generally, it's almost like a film that'll come right off. So bluing is not an issue with high speed steel. It won't get as sharp, but it'll last a lot longer. A lot of the new tools, the, A2, the A2s, the A10s, the 2030, 2060, it's just a different composite. Uh, it's an alloy of steel. It starts out as carbon steel, and then they add all kinds of alloys to it to make it last longer. The cryogenic tools, everybody's familiar with the Henry Taylor cryo tools. Um, do they work? Yeah, they work. Are they worth the money? In my opinion, no. That's just my opinion. Um, What's your opinion on powdered metal? Well, that's the same. It comes in the same, you know, the same thing. Uh, here's a powdered metal right here. This is my roughing bowl gouge. I rough out bowls with this, and I can probably in, in four passes have the entire outside of a bowl roughed. I take three quarter inch to inch ribbons with this tool. It's powder coated, but I have another one that's not powder coated. That's exactly the same grind that I switch off on because when I'm roughing out bowls, I want to get them done. And I don't find the difference one lasting any longer than another. So I, I don't really think there's much of a difference there. But now, again with the wheels. The one on the left is a pink wheel, and that's a regular friable wheel, and that's made for high-speed steel. The one on the right is called an SG wheel. And that's, uh, it's made by Norton, and it's actually made for powdered metals and things like that. They do have a separate wheel designed strictly for that. Now, people talk about the grid of the wheel. Uh, the grid of the wheel is important in some respects because one thing people don't realize, everybody thinks the finer the grit, the less heat it creates. That's exactly 180 degrees wrong. The finer the wheel, the more heat it creates. So, uh, everybody's familiar with the Tormac? Anybody use the Tormac for sharpening their uh, turning tools? You do? Do you smoke a pipe? <laughs> the analogy with a pipe is, you ever watch somebody smoke a pipe? They spend hours playing with this thing. They get nothing done, but they're tamping and they're playing and they're, they're puffing on it and they're, they're lighting it and playing. They get nothing done. Well, if you just stand there for a half hour sharpening a tool, it's actually too sharp. And it sounds crazy, but it's too sharp for turning. When we have a piece of wood going across that super smooth, highly polished surface at 2,000, 2,500, even 1,000 RPM, there's no tooth to catch the wood. So you're really forcing that tool into the wood to get it to start cutting. Once it starts cutting, it's fine. But it's actually too sharp, I mean too smooth and too sharp, to actually create the cutting. It's not noticeable right away, but it is noticeable after a while. When you start working with that tool, if you've never used one before and suddenly somebody hands you a tool sharpened on one of those, you can actually see that polished surface. Try cutting with it. It does not cut very well. It's very sharp, but get the cut started. It's too smooth. 